Do you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? Quiet, numbskulls, I'm broadcasting. Can we get serious now? One thing that did happen during the 60s was some music of an unusual or experimental nature did get recorded and did get released. Now look at who the executives were in those companies at those times. Not hip young guys. These were cigar chomping old guys who looked at the product that came and said, I don't know. Who knows what it is? Record it, stick it out of it, sells, all right. We were better off with those guys than we are now with the supposedly hip young executives who are making the decisions of what people should see and hear in the marketplace. Success in the music business begins with a dream, a vision. This podcast will give you, the listener, the insight and tools to turn that vision into a reality. Meet the industry professionals who work day by day behind the scenes, helping to make those dreams come true. Welcome to the business side of music. Normally, we say sitting across the console from us, but uh, this gentleman today is actually sitting a little farther away from us, Stockholm, Sweden, I believe, correct? Correct, yes. Diego Farias is with us, who is the CEO and founder of a company called Amuse, which we're going to talk about today. And I love the one line that I read in the show notes I got from your publicist who said, what would a record label look like today if it started? That's a good question because, and you and I had this conversation for a minute before the show started, that everything is so much up in the air. Nobody knows what's going on, and, and especially in our business, in, in the music right. entertainment field. First of all, let's, let's talk a little bit about you. How did you get started in, in the music industry? So I want to say that my start in the record or music industry was uh, as a child, a uh, very musically kind of oriented family. My brother played in a ska band. Uh, my mom has always been in a choir. Um, and there was just a lot of music around. My father is a hippie from back in the days. So <laughs> always a lot of music and always a lot of um, music related stuff. So I want to say that it started there. But uh, on, a, on a more kind of professional level, I stumbled into the industry as a result of being, you know, one of these techie kind of kids back in the uh, early 2010, somewhere around there. And I came from having had a couple of successful stints at Swedish technology companies, had been really, really successful on an international uh, level. And uh, I was asked to come to Warner Music in Sweden and help them transform that business into being a digital music company. And the reason for that request was that they were starting to see early signs of revenues from Spotify back in those days. Um, and they wanted to transform their business to, to, to fill what they expected to be different needs in, in the next few years. So I spent a few years at Warner Music and that's kind of how I uh, stumbled into the industry. And, and I've been uh, stuck here since. I mean, it's probably the most, the most exciting industry anywhere in the world. It is definitely the, one of the most exciting, if not the exciting industry to be in. And also it's an interesting time to either develop or start up a new company and to get it on its feet and get it running. When we talk about Amuse, and, and we're going to get into the dynamics of what this company is about, when did you start Amuse and, and what was the reasoning behind that? So I, I left Warner Music to work in sub-Saharan Africa, believe it or not. I was working for Hans Holger Albrecht, who is now the CEO of Deezer, the French uh, streaming platform. And he was running a telecommunications company in Africa. I was tasked with um, setting up a, a process similar to what has happened in the U.S. with AT&T or Sprint, where they partner up, where the different music services partner up with a, a telecommunications company to, to kind of widen the reach of those uh, music uh, platforms in, in different markets. So I was tasked to do that in sub-Saharan Africa and uh, experienced what you know was a brand new world for me. I had no knowledge or, or experience working in sub-Saharan Africa. I encountered, uh, you know, <laughs> tons and tons of, of young people who are trying to get into the music industry. And it seemed to me that there were fairly arbitrary technical problems that were hindering them from participating in the industry fully. So some of the stuff were as basic as, you know, most kids down there have phones, not computers. Okay, why aren't most services kind of tailored to work for phones? Or it could be stuff like, you know, these kids down there have money, but they have them on mobile wallets. 
So, you know, it doesn't work for them to have to use a service where they have to pay with a credit card because they don't have a credit card. So there were all of these kind of small arbitrary challenges. I was looking at all of those and I was combining the frustration that I was feeling around those kind of arbitrary technical challenges. I was combining that frustration with all the frustration I had felt when I was at Warner Music, which I felt uh, was a company that just didn't understand what was going on or, or where the future of the industry was going. And some of the stuff that I had been complaining about was how Warner Music at that time wasn't paying attention to data and the consumption of music and how it creates data footprints. So I had had kind of the data complaints or frustrations from Warner Music, and I had this all of these technological challenges that I was encountering in sub-Saharan Africa. And between the two of them, I found that there could probably be a business um, in building technological services to allow as many people as possible around the world to participate in the industry and then leveraging all of the consumption data from all the streams that these artists would generate and build a a really exciting business around there. And since then, the kind of idea has matured. And I think that little pitch that you read, I think, summarizes kind of how we approach the industry nowadays, which is, you know, there are the, the industry has just dramatically transformed in the last few years businesses have to look differently to address the needs of artists in 2020 and the future. What is that value proposition? And I think because our company is a new company, it's easier for us to be nimble and and flexible in trying to answer that question. That's, I guess, the the kind of a longer intro to to how this all came to be. I like how you brought up the sub-Saharan Africa aspect of things, because especially Here in the United States, North America, Canada, other parts of the world, we don't sometimes realize how big that demographic is, how many people are there, how they love music, and most importantly with what you've described, how they obtain that music and listen to it on different platforms uh, than typically what we're used to here in the United States or Europe. Yeah, I think that's really a, a really good observation. That was one of the problems I had. I was reaching out to the big global distribution companies who are all American, and I was asking them why African artists couldn't use their services and why they weren't interested in in making the modifications needed to address that market. And for me, the kind of crickets that appeared on the other end of the line every time I initiated those conversations were an indication to me that there was a space and time where I could, you know, get on with whatever it was that I was thinking. Yeah, and and that's the other thing, too, is when I know from I know from our show, Mm -hmm. from the podcast here, Africa is one of our larger markets, uh, especially when you look at South Africa is is a big audience for us. Democratic uh, Republic of Congo is one Kenya, Ghana, Nigeria, they're they're all listening to the show. So it helps us to maybe say, uh, awaken ourselves and realize that there's other markets out there that we need to look at and focus on. So with that being said, does it affect you being based out of Stockholm, Sweden to work in other markets like that around the world? And also, are we starting to unify as one platform of play, if maybe that's how we'd put it, as a streaming service, is that all catching up around the world? Or are we still delivering music content in different methods? Yeah, well, those are two good questions. And I just want to say before I answer them that I think one of the things that we realized when we started building a service for Africa was how similar the needs were of African artists to a poor kid in a suburb of Atlanta or a young kid of immigrant background in a suburb of Stockholm or Peru or Chile or wherever it could be. So so that was an interesting lesson. I just wanted to add that to, to provide a little bit more background. But let's see if I remember the two questions. One of the questions was, are we kind of moving towards this, this unified music world as far as streaming services go or consumption goes? Yeah. I think the answer, the answer to that continues to be uh, no. Um, I think in the two kind of er- the two markets that are distinguishing or, or kind of that are outside of what I would refer to as the rest of the planet would be Africa to some extent where there are still a lot of local players uh, based on kind of MP3 uploads and and more simple types of upload formats. Uh, The other one would be Korea, Japan, China, which have their own kind of ecosystems and and, uh, still have music services that don't accept file formats like DDEX, which is the universally agreed upon 
file format to deliver music between different services. So there's still a challenge that needs to be overcome in terms of being able to deliver music everywhere in the world. And I think companies like uh, the one I run, uh, it's our responsibility and our you know, challenge to make sure that we integrate as many of these global players as services as possible to be able to uh, allow these artists everywhere in the world to participate in the same in the same game, if you want. I know that when we talk about sub-Saharan Africa, we also have other markets that our show is in, you know, such as India, Pakistan, yeah. Nepal. Are you finding the same, and I don't know if I want to say limits, because I don't know if that's correct. Are you finding the same challenges in those other countries too? You mentioned Japan and South Korea and China. And I know from our perspective, or at least from our standpoint on our show, we're not in China at all because I don't think our program actually gets into that country. But we're big in South Korea and Japan too. But So are, are there other challenges that go beyond just the sub-Saharan Africa continent yeah. and getting into other parts of the world? Yeah, definitely. I think two of the markets you mentioned, India and, and Pakistan, Bangladesh would be a kind of third one to throw in that uh, group of countries. I mean, incredibly populous nations with a culture that dates back thousands of years and some of the strongest you know, music lovers anywhere on the planet. Um, I think some of the challenges perhaps in some of those markets is that a lot of the music in India, for example, is tied to the Bollywood scene and, and the movie scene. And, and from what some observations would be that, you know, a lot of the music then is covers of songs that have appeared in those movies. And there's it creates a little bit of a copyright situation in, in India, from what I understand. So I think there are definitely challenges in every market. And I think then there might be regionally specific challenges in a country like India, for example. But like I was saying before, I think it's our job to, to solve these challenges and make sure that to kind of remove those barriers of entry to make sure that everyone can, can participate. And that's, that's always been the mission of Amuse. We're going to take a break, get a word in for one of our sponsors. And when we come back, we're going to have some more conversation with Diego Farias. And we're going to talk about your company, Amuse, and what it has to offer. This is Rick Caballo with Dedos Branding. You're tuned in to another edition of Business Side of Music. It's like a good book that you just can't put down. You're listening to the business side of music. Hi, everyone. I'm Larry Butler, and I want to send you a free digital copy of my new book, The Singer-Songwriter Rulebook, 101 Ways to Help You Improve Your Chances of Success. That's right. Everything you need to know to launch your career as a singer-songwriter, all based on my 40 years in the live performance arena. And believe me, I've seen it all. In my book, you'll find the 10 things you have to deal with before even thinking about becoming a singer-songwriter-performer. You'll also learn about the five things every singer-songwriter can do this weekend to make their live show better. Five things I can guarantee that you are not doing already. Plus, there's tips on songwriting and staging, photo and video shoots, publishing, merch, dozens of other topics. All written for people who don't particularly like to read. And again, it's free. Just go to the Business Side of Music website homepage and look for my book cover. Click on it and a free digital copy of my book will be yours. I'm Larry Butler and I approve of this message. Whether you consider yourself a musician or not, music is all around us and it affects our everyday lives. Whether it's background music influencing our shopping habits in a store, organ music adding the vibe to a baseball game, or a playlist convincing us to keep going on that last mile of a run. I'm Mindy Peterson, host of the podcast Enhanced Life with Music, where we take a holistic look at music's benefits through the lens of science and medicine, entertainment, and business. You can find me and Enhanced Life with Music at mpetersonmusic.com slash podcast or wherever you get your audio. You're listening to the business side of music. On the show with us today, all the way from Stockholm, Sweden, it's early afternoon here. It's evening there. Diego Frias is with us with Amuse. Thank you for being on the show Let's talk about your company, Amuse, which was founded what in, in 2017? Yeah, we launched the service in uh, 2017. And, and, and sorry, let me just say thanks for having me, Bob. Great honor. Um, yeah, the company was, was uh, we launched it in 2017, and we usually use that date as kind of a reference as to when we got started in the industry. 
the concept of the company, what is Amuse and what does it what does it do? Yeah. So um, Amuse does a couple of different things all in the same umbrella of, uh, of services. So we think our, uh, of ourselves as a, as a company that provides services for artists. So we do music distribution. That's, that's kind of the entry point for Amuse. It's a necessity for artists. And uh, what we refer to when we talk about uh, music distribution is, is moving a file a song from an artist into the different music services, collecting consumption data, collecting the revenues and, and sending those back to the artist. That's kind of where the Amuse journey starts. And then we built around, we built services around that. So for us, that's, an, that's the step into our universe. And then we provide services like uh, Fast Forward, which is a super, super, super cool uh, automated royalty advance system. We have a record label sitting on top of this. Uh, we have our technological pro services sitting on top of this. So we think of this as, um, as a marketplace where there are tons of cool stuff that artists need to be able to succeed and elevate their careers. And we think that Amuse can build the different types of technological solutions and provide more kind of, um, you know, traditional services to, to fill those needs and, and, and help the artists along their, their path. Are you more European centrally located or are you global? Is this something that that any artist can use? And, and I'm assuming, let me back up here. My thought process is this is artist driven for them. It provides them a, a distribution platform to get their music out there, correct? Yes, sir. Is this something that is focused primarily out of the European market or can some singer songwriter artist out of say, you know, Austin, Texas, can they use your service? Yeah. So, I mean, I'll answer that shortly, but Sweden is a country of 10 million people. Uh, unless you're you're building a service that, you know, sells groceries, you probably have to look outside of the country's borders to be able to build a, a big business. Amuse is a global business, was from day one, has always been. Our biggest market is actually the U.S. Uh, that's where the majority of our talent comes from. And then we are very strong in Latin America, for example. Chile, Argentina would be two examples. Spain is a great market for us. South Africa is another good market for us. And the Nordics has been incredibly successful for us. I mean, we're, I would guess that you saw all of these Spotify rap things that came out last week. Spotify summarized the year in Sweden. And out of the five biggest artists in Sweden in 2020, three of them were Amuse artists. That's success on an absolutely colossal level. What makes a muse different than, say, CD Baby that's out there? What are you providing? And I'm, and I'm not trying to put the spotlight on them so much. Is, uh, are sure. you providing something that's, that's unique and different for that? What, what would sway that artist to come to a muse? Yeah, I mean, for me, um, music distribution was always a part of the greater offering of a muse. It wasn't the entire business. Uh, in the case of CD Baby and TuneCore, uh, for example, they are music distribution businesses full stop. So for us, the music distribution is a, is a necessity, of course, like I was saying before. But we also think that we have to build additional services around it uh, to be able to, uh, um, to address the changing uh, and evolving needs of talent around the world. That's why we built services like Fast Forward, or that's why we have continued to develop our pro, uh, pro offering. That's why we have a record label sitting on top of all of this, because we think that the, we can address more of the artist's needs than just the distribution service. So for us, it's a, it's a full service type of a business and not only a distribution business. That's, I think, the main differentiation. Distribution is so important of still. Course. Not as much as it used to be from a physical aspect years ago when we were moving cds mm -hmm. but is the record label for what you're seeing out there on that global aspect is a record label still make sense especially for the independent art artists and i ask this a lot with the guests that we have on our show that pertains to this but does it make sense to have a record label deal out there or just a distribution deal or both? Well, I think that's a really good question. And if I if I can kind of muddy uh, the beginning of my answer a little bit or make it even more 
difficult to comprehend. I would say that the challenge here is that the term record label means so many different things to so many different people nowadays. It's been changed. It's been adopted by all sorts of different businesses. You know, you have media companies doing label deals or there are so many different players in that space that there's really no one way of thinking about a record label deal nowadays. So for us, it goes back to answering that question that we talked about in the beginning of the show, which is what is it that people want and need? And if we can provide that, then we can do that in the shape of what we refer to as record label deals. So the answer is that some artists want a record label deal. And in some cases, that can be that they need help in marketing. In other cases, it might mean that they need financial assistance to be able to get their business on the, off the ground. In some cases, it might mean opening up the doors to uh, the different music services to allow the artists to be able to present their music in a good way or even easier, allowing us to do the same thing. So I think it can mean a lot of different things in 2020 and in the future. And I think that if we if we think about record label deals as being just one constant thing, then it's going to uh, it's going to make it more difficult to answer this question. If we approach this with more flexibility, then I think it's fair to assume that record labels deals will continue to be around and be competitive and be interesting to a large number of artists in the future as well. When it comes to the distribution aspect of things, is there a focus on more of one platform more so than another getting your music out there we all talk about spotify i think <clears throat> pandora still seems to be on some people's radar uh, but is are are there other outlets that maybe the artist is not aware of that's not seeing as viable that actually is well i think it um, def- definitely in um, in other regions outside of kind of Western Europe and, and the US, UK, I think Latin America, parts of Latin America, there might be local services that still, you know, can can push a lot of traffic in a certain direction. Uh, but I think that what people are asking for the most is to be on kind of the big three, four, five stores. Um, so maybe like a Spotify, Apple, Amazon, I don't know, YouTube. And then beyond that, we make sure that they are on a bunch of other platforms too. And some of them are more relevant than others. Some are, some of them are uh, still around because they did a bunch of good telco deals. Uh, some might be around because they have a strong regional presence in a market like Denmark or you know, China or whatever it could be. But I would say there's there's definitely um, there are a couple of bigger players that dominate the space. And I would probably add some of the Chinese or or Korean or Japanese stores into that mix too. And then uh, I think those are the services that are bringing in most value every month. When people look at their statements at the end of the month, they're going to see a handful of different services at the top of that, which will probably have generated 95 to 97% of their income. We're going to take another break. When we come back, we're going to talk about how the artist can get their music on Amuse and what they can expect. In the studio from Stockholm, Sweden today, Diego Farrias. This is Amira Alvarez, the founder and CEO of The Unstoppable Woman. Thanks for joining me with host Bob Bender on the business side of music, my favorite music business podcast. You're listening to the business side of music. Are you curious about Gordon Lightfoot's songwriting process or what it was like working with Prince in the 80s? Have you ever given any thought to what goes into a golf course design or writing a book? I'm Steve Waxman, the host of The Creationist, a podcast about people who create. Each episode features a different creator sharing stories that I hope will inspire your own creativity. The Creationist is available now on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. You're listening to the business side of music. Back on the show with us, Diego Farias, who is with Amuse out of Stockholm, Sweden. We have talked, probably one of the very first times we've talked about other markets besides the United States and Canada. We've obviously, with previous guests on the show, have talked a little bit about Scandinavia, Sweden, and that market. Let's jump a little farther now and talk about the artist who maybe has looked at such platforms as TuneCore or CD Baby and is now looking at Amuse, what can that artist 
expect, what they should be looking for, uh, and the different services that you have to offer a little more in detail. We talked briefly about the record label and fast forward, but let's get into some detail on, on those services. Sure. Just to your point, there are a couple of different services that an artist can participate in when they go through the, their Amuse journey. Uh, Amuse usually starts for most of our artists with our uh, entry entry level service, which is a basic distribution service. We provide that service for free, so it would allow an artist to uh, to upload their music and have it delivered to a smaller number of stores around the world, but get it into the, kind of the most important stores and and get their uh, artist career on the way. After that, the next offering that we would have would be Amuse Pro which we have a, um, a promotion price on right now, which would be $20 a year. Um, it's otherwise $60 a year, um, which would be the equivalent of like a TuneCore or a CD Baby in terms of stuff that you can expect as an artist. We have a couple of things in there that they don't have. We have splits, for example, which allows artists to split the royalties at source and just have their share of, uh, of a project instead of having to figure that out afterwards. We have a super cool feature called Teams, which allows people to participate in numerous different projects and, and basically have the capabilities of running a label on top of the Amuse technology that we've provided. So I think there are a couple of differentiating factors on our paid offer compared to uh, the competitors, which I think puts us forward as you know uh, one, of the, one of the best options for anyone who is looking to deliver their music to stores. Around that, we've built other services. Fast Forward is one of them. And Fast Forward, anyone is eligible for Fast Forward who is on Amuse. The way Fast Forward works is that it basically looks at your uh, revenue earnings uh, or your earnings, rather, calculates using, you know, millions, actually billions of data points. It calculates a royalty advance. You get offered that royalty advance in the app. If you choose to accept it, you accept it. The money gets paid out to you immediately. We've heard fantastic stories about how people then use that money, everything from just you know buying a guitar or, or paying the electricity bill or paying for some studio time or a tour bus or whatever it could be. So a really, really cool service that allows people to get advances ranging from you know 60 bucks, which prior to Corona, maybe some people would have scoffed over post Corona. If someone's giving you 60, 70 bucks against your music and it doesn't mean signing away your rights forever, then that's probably something that people find to be a very uh, enticing offer. And let's let's talk about that for a moment too, because yes, they're not selling their soul to the devil when they do this, right? <laughs> I, I'm sure there's someone out there who will claim that I am the devil. Uh, personally, <laughs> uh, I disagree. <laughs> but no, I think your point is is valid, uh, which is you know the fast forward basically ties down the different as uh, the different songs for the duration of the time that you recoup the advance. That usually takes six months or something like that. When that is done, then all of the rights revert to you. Uh, but obviously, in the meantime, while we are recouping, we need to have something against the advance that we uh, provided you with. But yeah, it's, it's an incredibly strong deal. I mean, we've seen deals ranging from the hundreds of thousands of dollars to 60, 70 bucks around the world. I mean, we see deals from every, neck, every corner of the world on a daily basis, which is super, super cool. Let's talk about fast lane support. So that's I think that's one of the things that also sets us apart. I've seen I've seen some really sad stories on on Reddit, for example. People have to set up their own forums to answer questions and kind of help each other because they can't get help from people. I, I don't believe in that. So if you sign up to use Amuse Pro, we promise you an answer in 24 hours. It's a really, really strong proposition. You know, you have to take into account that. A lot of the people who are entering the space now, especially during the Corona time, which has been an incredible boost, boom of energy across the world. I think a lot of these are first time artists. Maybe they're or, you know, maybe they are first time releasing artists who used to run a successful touring business and now suddenly find themselves needing to release an old album that they had and hadn't put up for some reason. These might be people who need a little bit of handholding and guidance to figure out this really complicated world. I mean, ISRC codes make sense to you and me, Bob, but if it's the first time that you're entering the business, then no clue what that's about. So providing really, really strong uh, customer support and, and uh, um, you know, guiding our, our artists through what's probably the easiest distribution interface anywhere on the planet, I think um, makes sense to me. 
So how does the artist go about getting their music set up with you? Yeah, so like I said, I mean, I, I'm, I'm happy to kind of um, put myself out there a little bit and say we have the easiest way anywhere in the world. Not only do we operate an iOS and, and Android platform in addition to our web service, so, so you could theoretically upload your music from your iPhone while you're on the loo or sitting in traffic or whatever. Probably not sitting in traffic, but on the loo should be a safe place to up, upload some music. So you could do it from your phone. You could do it from your computer. You basically upload your, your WAV files uh, into our system, provide us with all the cool metadata that you know we deliver to all the stores so that they can sort your music in the right way or figure out who owns the music, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then we deliver it to the stores. It's incredibly easy. And I think the reason why it's incredibly easy is not only because it's kind of something we care about, i.e. making it easy, but our service is brand spanking new. Like we had the benefit of looking at everyone else and how everyone else does it and kind of say, well, that doesn't make sense. We should probably build it easier or better so that people can understand it and, and, and use our services in a really cool and easy way. With the Amuse Pro, and you were saying it's right now, it's a special deal, nineteen ninety nine a year. Is that per song or is that per album or how does that work? No, that would be for the full year. Uh, so you release as many songs as you want for the course of that year. Wow. Okay, uh, gotcha. So that's, a, that's a very competitive offer. And it includes all of that stuff that we were talking about. Um, it's really good turnaround times. It has that super good customer support. It includes those splits and the Teams functionality. So... Uh, as far as, you know, spending your 20 bucks wisely for distribution, I think uh, the Amuse deal that we have right now is probably the most solid one out there. And how can people find Amuse? Amuse is available online. Amuse, A-M-U-S-E dot I-O. Our apps are in the App Store and in the Android Store. Get going already. Don't look at your phone. Just go there. Yeah. Sounds like a great idea. One question before we go. What is... In, in your mindset, we talk about the United States, mm -hmm. uh, North America. Let, let's get outside of that. What is probably the, the second largest or maybe the second and third largest markets these days for music? So I, I, I actually don't have the exact numbers off the top of my head. But I, if, I can, if I can just frame it in my own personal way, I would say that, you know, the UK is, is obviously doing incredibly well. We've seen an an insane explosion of songs coming out of, for example, the drill scene, which I think is a really interesting scene to be looking into. The other thing that I would list would not be a country, but a genre. And I would say that lo-fi is a universal phenomenon that has no borders or no countries. It's a type of music or a genre of music that kids are producing in basements in Turkey or Mongolia or Finland, or Canada, or the U.S., or wherever it could be. So I would actually, if I could, if I could just do some trend, um, you know, looking into the uh, looking in the looking glass, I would say that between all the cool stuff that's going on in Europe, of course, um, UK being a, one of the strongest markets in that space, and lo-fi as a phenomenon with with the genres like funk or or a sad rap or whatever the other genres are that are affiliated with that. I would say those are two uh, interesting things to be uh, keeping an eye on in the future. That's actually really good information. Diego, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you so much for having me. The Business Side of Music is the creation of Tom Sabella and Tracy Snow and is produced by Bob Bender. The Business Side of Music is recorded at Music Dog Studios in Nashville, Tennessee. Production sound designed by Keith Stark. Voiceover and promo by Lisa Busan.
You're still here? It's over. Go home. Go.